Now we have a recurring guest, Marxian economist, Professor Richard Wolf. He's here to parse out what our economic system now looks like as a result of the health system that he says puts profits over people. He'll also hopefully give us a brighter future maybe we might be able to hope for and some steps we need to take to make it a reality. Professor Richard Wolf is a Marxian economist, well known for his work on Marxian economics, economic methodology and class analysis. He is the host of Economic Update with Richard D. Wolf, which is syndicated on over 70 radio stations nationwide and available for broadcast on Free Speech TV. Professor Wolf, thanks for joining us again on the program. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ju Juliana. I'm really glad to be here. Well, you have been predicting uh, that because our economy is so fragile, it would just take the brief flap of a bird's wing to knock it over. And uh, I think we're here. Am I right? Absolutely. And, and let, me, let me sort of explain that very briefly. Uh, we are only 20 years into a new century, and we have already had three major collapses of capitalism. Uh, I know many people don't remember because you don't want to. Who wants to remember that kind of a thing? But in two th early in the year 2000, we had what we now call the dot-com crash. Mm -hmm. That's when we had all these companies that were worth billions of dollars that had never turned a profit and, would, and who told their own shareholders that they didn't expect to for years into the future, mm -hmm. but were selling for wild amounts of money their shares were. So that all, that house of cards collapsed and we had a very serious economic downturn. Then in 2008 and nine, more people will remember that one, we had the so-called subprime mortgage collapse and that brought the economy down. And now we have the coronavirus collapse. Uh, here's my hot tip. If the system falls down tragically, catastrophically, three times in 20 years, then it probably isn't only the trigger that made it happen, but there's some vulnerability here that ought to be addressed. And the vulnerability is in our capitalist system. And unfortunately here in the United States, we still work under a taboo that we can criticize almost anything, but just not the capitalist system, because that, as we all have been taught, is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Can you talk about what we are already seeing in terms of fundamental changes to our economy as the result of this coronavirus? Well, absolutely. Or as the result of uh, you know uh, a, a bad system in the first place and then a coronavirus tipping point. Yeah, we're seeing a cascade of problems. And, and let me explain it this way. In the aftermath first of the dot-com crash of 2000. And then again, in the aftermath of the subprime mortgage crash of 2008 and 9, one of the things the United States government did through the Federal Reserve was to drop interest rates to record lows. We all know that. Interest rates, you know, in the neighborhood of zero to two percent, somewhere in there. Uh, we'd never seen that before, let alone for long periods of time. And what that did over the last 20 years is lead every player in the economy, the government, the corporations, and the rest of us, the people, to do something we shouldn't have done, which is to paper over every economic problem we had by borrowing limitless amounts of money at ridiculously low interest rates. Uh, for example, every corporation in America, with very, very few exceptions, is loaded up with debt to this point, more debt than it has ever had before. And here's what happens. If suddenly the income, imagine you're a business of some sort, any business, if suddenly your income, your revenue drops, it's not only bad for you and your employees and all of that, but you can't pay your debts. You can't pay the principal back. You can't pay the interest back, which means all of the other entities that got together to lend you that money, starting with the government, but all other kinds of corporations too, are now in deep trouble. And that's what we have. We've been having it now for weeks and months. 
a cascading collapse because we are an over indebted society that suddenly saw a break in business. Nobody's going to the restaurant, so they're not making any money. Nobody's going to the big event. It's not making any money. No one is using our airplanes. They're not making any money. You get the picture. Nobody is doing anything. And suddenly businesses are not earning their income. They can't pay their debts. Everybody who lent to them and assumed they would be getting a flow of interest doesn't have that. So they can't pay their debts. That's when you have a collapse. And that's what we're going through right now. Professor Wolf, uh, can you explain to me uh, something simple that occurs to me? You know, for can't we just, when the stock market starts plummeting, they pause it. Can't we just pause all the debts? Can I not pay my rent if my, if my landlord doesn't have to pay her mortgage? She wouldn't necessarily need my rent. If, you know, couldn't we just take a full on pause? Why is this not happening? First answer is absolutely we could. And in some societies, they are moving towards doing that. But here comes the problem. The only agency in our society that we have to turn to, to do anything as comprehensive as what you just suggested, is the government. No private company can do that. Mm -hmm. None of us as individuals, none of us as groups can do that. The only agency is the government. And what it would mean if we did it, let me, let me give you the idea in a different words and you'll get it. It would mean that we have to admit that a private enterprise economy got us into such a collapse by the way it normally works that we had to extricate ourselves by telling the entire capitalist system, stop, don't pay what you owe. Don't collect what is owed to you. Everybody freeze. And then the government will have to reorganize since we can't literally stop. We still have to you know, produce and distribute food and produce and distribute. So those things have to happen even if the company that is producing the food owes money, which it isn't paying, relies on money to be paid it, to it, which isn't forthcoming, the government will have to come in and plan everything, organize, and the private sector has the following deep anxiety. If you let the government come in and do that, how many of the people will conclude that it's better to have yeah, the government do this yeah. <laughs> than it is to have the private? Why are we bringing the government in only when the private sector collapses, maybe we should have the government in there and then the game is up. Then the people have recognized that a private capitalist system isn't the be all, the end all, the best to the best. And you know, the people who run private capital, they understand all this perfectly well. That's why they never allow the conversation to go this way. They talk about freedom. We shouldn't be controlled by the government. What they really mean is we should be controlled by them, by the private employers who run the show of the economy now. We, to get, uh, we were just talking about uh, what's happening at Amazon and the worker strikes that are starting to pop up across the, the, the across different sectors. Inclu I went to the grocery store the other day, wore my mask, wore my gloves, et cetera. And I spoke to one of the workers at Whole Foods, which is owned by Amazon. Um, they said that, that, that the worker said Amazon won't let them wear masks in the store. I mean, what is this? <laughs> this is, you know, and they're doing, a, a, they're doing worker walkouts. The workers are being penalized for participating in organized labor. Can you talk a little bit about what is this moment for organized labor? It seems like, seems like a, you know, it seems like we're, we're in a, a moment for organized labor. Yes, we are. Uh, and I think it goes back to the same issue. A corporation is there to make money. That's what corporations are set up to do. That's what they're trained to do. They therefore make their decisions based on what they feel is their bottom line, which is profitability. 
That's the basis on which they are graded as being successful or not. That's the basis on which a, uh, a corporate executive is promoted or not, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they look at a mask worn by a checkout person at the grocery store and they say, oh my God, wearing a mask is going to scare the That's people. That's what I thought. Here. I thought it was good. They're doing it. So they it's going to scare people. people. And if they are scared, they won't come here. And if they don't come here, they won't buy the, the, the food off the shelf, et cetera, et cetera. And our profit will be impact. It's not that they're mean, nasty people. I mean, they may be, but that's not really the issue. They're caught in a system that demands of them certain kind of behavior, punishes them if they don't do it, rewards them if they do do it. And so they end up doing it like most of us would. If you don't like this crazy situation that profits in a grocery store trump, and I use the word with enjoyment, trump your uh, public safety, then it's the system that's your problem. Let me give you a couple more examples. Instacart, a very big a company across America with 200,000 employees, they're going on strike. Whole Foods workers are going on strike. Amazon workers are going on strike. Airline uh, attendants, people in the airport, you know, who move your luggage and so on. They're uh, active. There's a lot of it. Here's another one. Hospitals across the United States recently began threatening, I kid you not, threatening nurses and doctors who speak to the media, who speak wow. to the public, wow. and who say things like, we don't have enough masks, wow. or we don't have enough ventilators, wow. or all the things that they're talking about. There And the hospitals are terrified that people who get sick will choose another hospital to be raced to because they don't want to go, obviously, to a hospital that isn't equipped to help them through this illness. But, you know, not telling the public where it's safe to go is an inhumane, unethical, immoral behavior which the people are rightly enraged about. But it's the logic, if a hospital is trying to profit, which hospitals, the private ones anyway, are always trying to do, and the public ones are basically trying to keep themselves from being losers financially. When you make that rule, well, then you're gonna get this result. Now, here's what I think is, is where you're going with it, and I would agree. People are now, it's a little bit like the dog who does something on the rug that the dog shouldn't have done. And some people respond by kind of taking the dog and putting their nose near what they just did. So they learn the lesson, don't do that again. We are all like dogs right now. We are being taken by this system and our nose is putting real close to something that smells real bad. Yeah. And that is a system that is subordinating our health to a profit calculation. And that's not a system anybody should be in. Neither those of us that are victimized by it, nor the people who are being forced to act in a way that they too, in a moment of quiet, would recognize is not the proper way to interact in a community. Professor Wolf, uh, I haven't heard whether nurses and the nurses union are considering action. They're quite busy at this moment in time. So it, it you know, it does take, it does take organization to do actual organizing around this, but they're really getting, you know, put in incredibly, incredible amounts of harm's way due to this lack of, of, of gear. Isn't the federal government responsible for if, if, you know, I guess you can't prove where you may have gotten the coronavirus, but let's say 15 nurses at a hospital, God forbid, get the coronavirus as a block, they might be able to uh, sue the hospital, the government. Isn't this just going to cascade as we come out of this in terms of like legal matters? I, I wondered why the cashier at Whole Foods, if she gets the coronavirus, can't just sue the shit out of Amazon for not they're just assuming that they won't because it's a coronavirus and these people make $8 an hour or 12 or whatever it is and they're not gonna sue? Yeah, my guess is you will see all kinds of suits. Uh, if you're a, a worker at Amazon, 
uh, you will have to then pay a lawyer to do this for you. Uh, Jeffrey Bezos, who has $150 billion, will pay 400 lawyers to work against you. Uh, you'll get the legal system reflecting the economic inequality we already had, which it ha always has. Um, you're going to be in a tough spot, but yes, I agree. Um, these kinds of lawsuits and many others are waiting in the wings. Let me go back, though, to your nurses. They are not threatening to strike because they know that they are, they are what stands between life and death for all kinds of people, and they're not going to act. But wow, can you imagine then what it means that hospitals across America have threatened to fire either a doctor or a nurse or both, which means at a time of pandemic, when you need those people, their profit calculations, the damage to them from the public knowing the truth about where equipment is or isn't, is so important to them, they will remove a caregiver in the middle of a pandemic. That gives you an idea when a system has reached the end of its acceptability. James Napper-Tandy in our chat says, how many medical care professionals are working right now to treat COVID and using their wages to pay off their own medical debt? The answer should now be zero. It's very interesting. Yeah, of course, there are thousands of things that we ought to be doing. We should have been doing this long ago. Uh, I like to remind people, viruses are not new. Deadly viruses are not new. In recent history, we've had uh, Ebola, we've had MERS, we've had SARS, and if you go back to 1918, we had the thing we call the Spanish flu, a funny name since it began on a military base in the middle of Kansas, the United States, but was called the Spanish flu. They need to found a, find a brown person to blame it on, yeah. just like Trump is calling it the Chinese virus or whatever. Right, extraordinary. No one ever called it the U.S. virus, even though it was the most deadly in the last century, and it started in Kansas. But put that all aside, any rational society that was committed to its own public health would know that when you have a virus, one of your biggest problems is infection, spreading the virus from one person to another. We know that because we've been through this a dozen times. So we should have had stockpiles of test kits, of ventilators, of masks, of gloves, of hospitals, of beds, of gowns, all the things you need. They should have been produced here, but they weren't because it wasn't profitable for a company to do that. We only produce in a capitalist system what's profitable. It wasn't profitable to produce them. It wasn't profitable to stockpile them. You know, a company that produced them but didn't have an immediate buyer would have to stick it in a warehouse somewhere that costs money, earns you nothing, so they didn't do it. Okay, wow. then the government could have and should have stepped in and bought them and stockpiled them. But the government is, has the same mentality, don't spend money, don't tax anybody. So the government is trapped by the same logic as if it were a profit-driven entity. So they didn't do it either. So we're all dying and we're all in deep trouble, not because the virus arrived, but because we are in a society, private and public, which failed in the most basic obligation of any, of any economic system and of any government is to take care first and foremost of the health and safety of the people. And if it doesn't do that, it's lost its right to continue. That's why I think people, whether they're striking or just living through it, are slowly and probably hesitantly coming to the conclusion that what we have here is not just a bad virus. We have a system that is exposed as incapable of handling and preparing us for it, and there really is no excuse. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, maybe contextualize what is happening in terms of the oil market, not just oil prices, but how is that uh, co compounding the coronavirus issue. I'm I'm looking for the exit. I'm looking for the exit. Is this an exit? Like, can we get off oil now? I mean, everybody's put the pipe down, like making a crack analogy. You know, everyone's putting the pipe down. We're not going anywhere. We're not really flying anywhere. 
is it possible that we could keep it down and grow our economy in a more green way after this happens or are we stuck economically you know in this case i just don't exactly understand how it ties together actually juliana from the way you asked the question i think you do oh. let me tell you why i think you do you know that what's behind the reliance on the oil and gas uh, as our energy source is the fact that some of the biggest corporations in the world and many of the governments of countries around the world are completely dependent for their wealth and power on oil and gas being the source of energy. Could we shift away from it? Of course we could. We could do it now. We could do it five years ago. We could do it 10 years ago. Of course we could. It's a complicated process, you know, like running an economy. If we told everybody, don't pay your debts, the only agent, here we go again, the only agency that could help us get from a reliance on fossil fuels to a reliance on renewable energy is the government that could take us through the organization, the planning, the adjustment, making people do things, uh, whether or not it's profitable to Trump move. Trump can't do that. He's a moron. <laughs> but it isn't, you know, much as I enjoy that too, uh, it isn't just Trump. It really wasn't different from the ones who went before Trump either. They're, they've all for, for, for many years been absolutely captured by the notion that private profit is a royal road to economic well-being. They believe it. They grew up on it. Their teachers taught that to them. And they can't break from it. And but even if they could, I don't think Trump, I just meant he couldn't organize it. Obama, I think, was at least intelligent enough that if he if he could get out of the orthodoxy, he would be able to put a plan together. I mean, well, here's, the, is here's the irony. If you look at any large corporation, any of them, Exxon, IBM, GM, GE, uh, Amazon, Facebook, they have an army of people who organize thousands, tens of thousands of people doing an immense variety of things across an immense diversity of locations. They all have that skill. We just need them not to do it for the private profit of a corporation, but rather to do it for the society as a whole. The government would lean on all of those people because they know how to do this sort of thing. Amazon inside itself doesn't use a market. It doesn't have one division buying and selling and negotiating from another. They plan, you produce this thing and ship it over there. You over there, you'll use it and make this thing, which you'll ship over there. They plan the economy. They do inside their enterprises what they keep telling us can't be done by the government. Sure it can. And if the we United are, States of Amazon is what's exactly. coming up here. You know, we could do all of that. We could even use the Amazon people, keep them working, keep them earning a living. But now they're doing something socially useful, namely weaning us off of oil and gas, which is dangerous, rather than making money by delivering packages a day faster than the competitor can. Uh, the news encourages us to look at the stock markets going up, going down, way up, way down, all the way down, way down, so down, far down, way, way down, um, as an indicator of what's happening in the economy. Can you talk to us about what we should really be looking at in terms of what is an indicator of this coronavirus economy? You know, the best indicator is the one you can see around yourself. In the first place, in your village, in your town, in your city, are the stores full and active, or are they abandoned? Are the streets busy? Are they not? You look around the United States today, you understand exactly that our economy has collapsed because the stores are all boarded up or locked up. You can only go for food. Or, I mean, we are like, as the president said correctly, we are like a society at war, reduced to the most basic uh, survival. Uh, so, of course, the economy has collapsed, number one. Number And you don't need the stock market to figure that out. The stock market is one of the places where our economy works. So yeah, it's an indicator. Is it the correct indicator? No, because no one thing is. It's like going to a doctor and saying to the doctor, I don't feel real well. Uh, tell me what's wrong. 
and the doctor sticks a thermometer in your mouth, tells you whatever the temperature is, and sends you home. You would never go to that doctor again because you I'm can't. I'm pretty sure tell. that's how they're testing for the coronavirus. Uh, that's well, you that's it. Because you can't tell properly from one index. You need, you know, that's why they have blood tests and why they have urine tests and all the things you, you, you're you asked to do by a doctor to, to give the doctor a sense of, of what's wrong or what can be done. Well, the same thing was with an economy. It's just as complicated as the human body. And you need lots of indices. The, the stock market is just one. But let me go back because it'll help people understand something. Over the last 20 years, to cope with ca capitalism's three crashes, the Federal Reserve flooded the American economy with money, as the central banks in other countries did as well. And a lot of that money did not go into producing goods and services because the mass of people didn't have the money with which to buy them and couldn't borrow anymore because they were already up to debt, uh, up to their eyebrows anyway, and they couldn't. So where did all that money go? Answer, into the stock market. Mm -hmm. And the prices in the stock market went crazy. Now that wasn't the sign that our economy's in great shape. That was Mr. Trump running for reelection. It was a sign that the pumping of that money was producing the feared inflation, but not in our daily life in the stock market. For people who had stocks, this was wonderful, except if they understood that the price of stocks was now completely unhinged from the underlying economy. And if something went wrong in the underlying economy that made it impossible for businesses to function, the price of shares, which were already overdone, would drop like a stone. And that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in uh, from the chat from James from ActTV. Question, why do we bail out corporations in the free market? Wouldn't another billionaire just buy them after they go bankrupt to make all that sweet profit for themselves? Yes, but corporations are able to act collectively in their own interests rather better than workers so far have been able to do. If and when that changes, so will the United States. So here's what corporations do. They make sure that the government bails them out. They don't want to have a war amongst themselves where one goes out of business and is bought out by the other. So all those lovely stories that you're taught in school about free markets and everybody struggles and the, you know, like a Darwinian, the successful business uh, outcompetes the less, all of that is thrown on the garbage heap. That's for students and old people to think about, but for the reality of business, they all want to be saved from a crash and from destroying one another. So they go to the government and they say, bail us all out. And believe it or not, we are the people, you, me, Juliana, and everybody watching and listening, we are the people who permit that. We permit them to be bailed out. This will be the third time in 20 years that our tax money goes to bail them out way more than any help to us. Billions for the Boeing Corporation. Let me just remind you, in the bill just passed, $2.2 trillion, billions of dollars to Boeing, which has admitted to being unsafe, to having thereby contributed to the crash deaths of over 340 people in the last year or two, we're giving them billions of dollars and we're giving half of the American working class $1,200. I mean, this, this level of insult to our collective intelligence is what they can get away with. And as long as we permit it, they will do that. How can we win the argument? Because it's like, oh, okay, well, Boeing is big and they need the money and therefore they're going to pay their workers and we need airplanes and blah, 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 blah. You know, this is the realist. This is when people think about it, that's what they think because they've been watching Fox News or Sinclair or wherever they're getting their news from. How do we win the, the, the war of minds? Well, part of our problem is the mainstream media are themselves these monster corporations. So they're certainly not gonna be in the forefront of presenting a different interpretation. 
And again, let me stress, as I did before, sure, we need airplanes, but we don't need Boeing. We have lots of people, including workers at Boeing, who would much rather be working for a national airline that provided the air traffic that we needed. When we bailed out the corporations in 2000, and then again in 2008 and nine, they said, thank you very much. But what they did was what corporations do. They raised the pay for their corporate executives. I was gonna say, did it come with any, was there any constriction oh, on the money? Virtually Ah, oh, we learned nothing. That's oh. right. And we didn't, and, and that's the irony. In the bill just passed, it's as if, to use your words, we learned nothing. There's a small limit on whether they can use the money that we gave them in bailouts to buy back their own stock. These are very important uh, uh, situations. And all I can tell you is it's a disaster that this is permitted to continue. Now the Democrats, well, everyone's calling you because they all want to hear, they need your perspective, <laughs> Professor Wolf. I'm assuming you're in high demand here. Everyone, uh, do you believe that if there were more Democrats in the Senate, if we had a majority in both the Senate and the House, that the Democrats would have learned? Because I did hear some, you know, the Democrats were trying to put conditions on things. Um, do you think that that would have been, I mean, conditions on the bailout in the first place is like putting a a drop of clean water in a toxic waste dump. But at the same time, do you think that that having a democratic control of the Senate because of the pressure that the left is now putting on Democrats to do a better job than they did under Obama, do you think that that would have at least put some sort of um, uh, constriction on the money? I think if you had a stronger progressive wing of the Democratic Party, uh, then that might be something to what you say. But as long as uh, people like the Clintons and uh, Biden, and I'm afraid also Obama, as long as those people are in charge, you're going to get very marginal improvements. That's what the Democrats seem to want to be. They are the party- Marginal improvement, the party of marginal improvement. Right. The party that whose program is, we're not as bad as those Republicans. And that's funny because the Republicans in their part of the country go around saying, we're not as bad as those Democrats. Uh, and so the whole country is, is choosing who to vote for by who is less awful. Um, but nobody has right a solution. You know, it, to one of the questions that we have coming in from Rebecca, uh, it's looking like Biden will be the nominee or the DNC will anoint an, a centrist. Voting to stop a neo-fascist Trump sounds reasonable, but why should we enable a system who is showing, who has shown over and over that they do not care about the working class? What are leftists to do with capitalism and our democracy seemingly in a free fall? Well, you know, this is a matter of everybody's political opinion. In my humble opinion, we have to have a political party whether it's the Democratic Party or another party uh, that is willing and able finally to say honestly that the centrists in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are two alternative ways, as Nancy Pelosi herself said, two ways of supporting capitalism. She answered the young man who asked her a few years ago in a very public way, what she thought about socialism. She looked kind of befuddled and answered him and said, we're all capitalists now. And I thought that was very honest of Nancy Pelosi. That's correct, that's what she is. That's what the party she leads uh, endorses. But we're in a society where there ought to be an opposition. There ought to be in all societies, somebody who's strong enough to organize those of us who think we can do better than this economic system. Republicans and Democrats don't believe that. We ought to have another party that says we can do better. Here's how we'll go about it. Here's why we feel that way. And then give Americans what they say they want, which is free choice. If you don't just want one brand of something, capitalism is one brand of economics, then you have to have a choice 
if the only brand of the of toothpaste in the supermarket is X, then we all have to buy X or our teeth fall out. Yes. Well, if you if you want a choice between capitalism and alternatives, you have to allow political expression of what the alternatives have to say, what programs they have to offer. We don't have that in the United States. We don't have the freedom of choice we claim to advocate. Can you think about times in history when there has been, have been moments of uh, crisis that really pull the curtain back on capitalism and the profit motive in different places where there shouldn't be a profit motive and, and have had you know, successful outcomes because I fear uh, authority, you know, full on authoritarianism. And we can see, we just spoke to Heidi Seek of Vote Pro Choice about how uh, the co uh, conservatives are using this moment to ram through all of their um, regressive agendas. Can Is there anywhere in history where this has turned out well? And do you have any hope for, for us? What can we do? Yes, uh, and that's a good way to kind of conclude our today's uh, chapter in all of this. Um, yes, I have hope. And yes, there are examples. And even better, one of the best examples is right here in the United States. So that should give you even more hope. And the example is the last time capitalism had a breakdown on the scale we are now experiencing. That was the 1930s. That's not that long ago. It's not ancient history. 1930s, we had a collapse like this. Uh, there wasn't a virus that set it off that time, but we had an economic collapse on the scale that we are now entering into and will soon arrive at. And at that point, the American people said, okay, we're not satisfied with how private capitalism got us into this mess. And we're not satisfied with the way it is coping or in our judgment, not coping with the mess it made. So here's what happened first, an effort was made to go to the American working class and say, we have to organize into powerful organizations that can make the government behave in a way we want. So the first thing that happened was millions, and I mean millions of people joined labor unions. These are people who had never been in a union before. They came from families whose parents had never been in a union before. They simply joined unions because they thought they might get through the terrible depression uh, in better shape in a union than if they didn't have a union. So it was called the CIO, you know, that part of the AFL-CIO, uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations. Millions joined. Hundreds of thousands of people joined two separate socialist parties here in the United States that became powerful. And yet another 100,000 or more joined something called the Communist Party of the USA. So you had three left-wing parties, two socialists, one communist, and the CIO, and they all worked together. And they went to the president of the United States and they said, the economy has collapsed. We don't like capitalism real well. Uh, and so we're gonna present you with a choice, Mr. Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Here's your choice. You have to help the people of this country right now in really big ways or else one, we're not gonna vote for you and therefore you're not gonna be president much longer. And number two, there's a bunch of us, the socialists and the communists over there who are gonna make a revolution in this country and wow, you don't want that, we know, but that's what's coming. So Roosevelt, he was a good politician. He understood he was talking to millions and millions of people. He understood they were his voters. So he said, okay, I'll do it. All I ask in return is that you stop talking about revolution, which most of them agreed to do. So here's what he did, just to give you an idea of what the government could do if we mobilized the demand to do it. Number one, early in the 1930s, the government established the social security system. Let me explain. We had never had that in the United States. When you got old, too old to work, 65 and older in those days, here's what you did. Either you saved up money, few had done that, or you became a burden on your family. Lots of people did that. Or you became a beggar uh, and hoped that the local church might give you something 
uh, on Sunday morning, etc. Now the government said, no, no, none of that anymore. You're not going to be destitute. You're not going to rely on the church. You're not going to be a burden on your children, which would be doubly hard during a depression. We're going to give you a check every month for the rest of your life. Wow, a government in the midst of a depression when it had no money, because in a depression, nobody's working, nobody's paying taxes. The government had nothing, but in the situation, they said, we're going to help every family. By the way, helping not just the old people who got the check, but their children who therefore would not have to sustain their parents in the way otherwise they would have had to do. No sooner was that done, then Mr. Roosevelt passed the federal unemployment compensation system. Suddenly, and we never had that before in America either. Suddenly you lose your job through no fault of your own. And there were tens of millions in that situation in the 1930s. We're gonna give you a check every week for a year or two to help you through. Wow. Next, they passed the first minimum wage in the United States. That was to protect working people so that employers, knowing how desperate workers were, wouldn't say to them, I'm going to lower your wage, and if you don't like it, get lost, because there's desperate unemployed people who will take your job in two seconds. To prevent that from happening, a minimum wage made it a crime to cut wages below a certain amount. And here comes the biggest and the best. Between 1934 and 41, the federal government led by Franklin Roosevelt, said, if, you, if the private capitalist sector cannot provide millions of people with all they ask for, which is a job, not charity, a job, they'll work, you pay them. If the private sector can't do it, which it obviously couldn't in those days, then I will do it as president. And between 1934 and 41, the federal government hired and paid 15 million people across the United States, giving them a job, giving them an income, preserving their self-esteem, allowing them to pay the mortgage to hold on to their home, et cetera, et cetera. Those were all things done to help the mass of people. None of them is being done now. Those were amounts of money that make the offer of $1,200 a person look as puny an insult as it is. So yes, it much better can be done. Not, not only better than Trump or better than the Republicans, but I have to say honestly, better than the Democrats uh, in power are offering. It is pathetic knowing what we did as a nation in the 1930s. And by the way, the list I gave you is not complete. Other things were done. A final footnote to leave with you. How was all of this paid for? Social security, unemployment, paying the salaries of 15 million working people. Roosevelt taxed corporations and the rich for a great deal of that money. Let me say that to you again. Corpor uh, the government taxed corporations and the rich. Compare that to now. Mr. Trump, the Republic and the Dem they don't even talk about it. Jeffrey Bezos sits on $150 billion. He would be the, one of the richest people in the world if you took half of that away from him mm -hmm. and the other billionaires. And that would allow the government to do all of these useful things without having to go into further debt than it's already in. But they're not going to do that. It's going to pay the $2 trillion by borrowing. And here's the joke. You know who the government will borrow from? Jeffrey Bezos. <laughs> because he has the money. And you know why he has the money? Because the same government that's borrowing from him didn't dare tax him. That's Bezos has know. got us. Has got, he's you know he's in charge. Yes. Like him or in charge. And we are the fall guy. He's he's really got us by the by the by the yes. by the tail, shall we yes. say? <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know he owns all the grocery stores and newspapers now. So yep. yep, yep. And as long as we allow this kind of an inequality to fester in our society, the more we're going to be watching the consequences uh, all around us, impacting us right down to our most personal lives. 
Professor Wolf, do you think it is too late? I mean, Jeffrey Bezos has so much power and he's not the only one. He has invested in, as I said, newspapers, uh, you know, um, he owns this platform that we're on right now. <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, Amazon, all of the delivery mechanisms that now people rely on for being things delivered to their house because they can't go out. Grocery stores, all of the products that, you know, he lets a small business sell on Amazon and then he makes the same thing and kicks the actual business out so that Amazon becomes the, the maker of it. I mean, are we too late? No. And the reason we're not is while we use words and sentences that say, Jeffrey Bezos does this, Jeffrey Bezos does that. He, of course, isn't the one doing it. It's an army of workers without which there is no Amazon. And there's an army of consumers without which there is no Amazon. If and when the workers and the consumers understand that in the end, they have the power, then the corporations will disappear out of our lives. The irony is they can only continue so long as we, the people, permit it. And they them, Jeffrey Bezos is just one guy and his executive team is just a group of guys. If the workers they command say, sorry, we're not doing that anymore. The way workers are now saying, we're not gonna work in an Amazon warehouse if, it, if it's not safe, or we're not gonna go into that uh, restaurant if it isn't uh, cleaned up properly, et cetera, et cetera. That's when the owner of the restaurant understands without those workers, there is no restaurant. He or she who own it, they don't make it happen. They just have a legal claim to it. And that legal claim is there only if we honor it. No wonder the first guy, the guy who was uh, um, organizing the strike at uh, the Staten Island Amazon got all over the mainstream media because they fired him for it. It was almost like, here's a cautionary tale. If you do it, we're going to fire you too. You know, they, they. Right. They really and, but but what's really, what's interesting, I have to get off, but what's interesting Sorry. to me, <laughs> no, no, no. My, my, what's interesting to me is that governors in at least two states as well as lots of media are reacting and feeling that the firing of that man was, was unacceptable, that he had every right to demand safe working conditions, um, that it is a scandal that Amazon's policy uh, is that you get two weeks of paid vacation if you have the coronavirus. Unbelievable, you know, a, a, a level of disrespect for the working class that the working class is noticing and is thinking about. And I think the sympathy for that uh, fired worker uh, is something Amazon better take very seriously because it will suffer if it does not. We've been speaking with Professor Richard Wolf. He's the host of Economic Update with Richard Wolf, syndicated on over 70 radio stations. Find it on YouTube. Support his work on Patreon. This man, you're like the one guy. I mean, you're the guy. So sequester yourself. <laughs> I, am, I am doing it, and I look forward to talking again with you soon. Thank you so much, Professor Wolf. We'll see you again, and stay well. And uh, this was great. Thanks for staying on for so long. We had so many questions. Good. Thank you. Take care, Julia. Bye-bye.